march of time. window of Adolf Hitler's Nazi Germany today is its capital city, Berlin. Here the casual visitor may be surprised by the air of prosperity, the well-dressed crowd, and by the abundance of rich food served in its cafes and terraces. Nowhere does the visitor see privation or hunger. Berlin's parks and playgrounds are filled with groups of plain, cheerful people who show no signs of dissatisfaction with the fascist dictatorship which controls their lives. No apparent resentment against a government whose campaign of suppression and regimentation has shocked the world's democracy. Only those who get behind the scenes know that this outward cheerfulness is the creation of Adolf Hitler's propaganda minister, Paul Joseph Goebbels. In the most concentrated propaganda campaign the world has ever known, Minister Goebbels has in five years of Nazi rule whipped 65 million people into a nation with one mind, one will, and one objective, expansion. Today the Goebbels thunder is louder than ever before. For Germany is serving notice that all territory she lost in the World War must eventually be given back to her. First of all, the million square miles which once comprised her African empire. To fan the Nazi hatred of Russia, a Goebbels museum is filled with exhibits to show the horrors of communism. Though six years ago, six million Germans voted a communist ticket, every known radical, every known liberal, Today is either in hiding, in prison, or dead. Still going on as pitilessly as it did five years ago is Goebbels' persecution of the Jews. Signposts at city limits bear the legend, Jews not wanted, Jews keep out. Even in parks, if Jews are allowed at all, special yellow benches are set apart, labeled for Jews. And on the Christian churches, Goebbels' propaganda machine is today bearing down savagely. For these, almost alone, are still offering resistance to the new order. And the Nazi state tolerates no rival authority over its people. In regimenting German thought, all radio programs emanate from the Department of Propaganda. Every newspaper prints only what the state wants its people to read. And any letter in the German mails is subject to censorship. For in Nazi Germany, every instrument that forms thought, communicates ideas, must be used to glorify the Nazi super state and its demigod, Adolf Hitler. In the five years since Adolf Hitler took command over a people reduced to despair by World War defeat and its aftermath of unemployment and poverty, he has dinned into his people by constant repetition the conviction that they are a super race headed for a great destiny and has shaken them into new self-respect, new strength. Das ist es, was ich von euch, meinen deutschen Bauern, wieder verlangen muss. It is from the ordinary German family that Adolf Hitler derives the immense power that he wields today. In millions of little homes, there is no longer unemployment and despair, for Adolf Hitler has given every man able to work a job, a newfound security. The average wage earner is paid but $10 a week, is told by the state what work he must do. By Nazi decree, he is denied the right to strike, or even ask his employer for a raise. Day and night, the roaring furnaces of the great Krupp munitions plant at Essen are fed by the self-denial of the German people. For Germany must import most of the iron ore it is forging into cannons and shells. And to pay for the raw materials of conquest, it must cut down dollar for dollar on the imports that might be going to feed its people. 
into fabricating the implements and machines of war rather than to the productive industries of peace go the resources and money of the German nation. But a grateful worker forgets when he comes home at night how much he is paying for his security. His household is run by propaganda bureau decrees. It is patriotic to wear clothes as long as they will last. A half pound of lard butter is the average weekly quota for the average home. It is patriotic to save every ounce of garbage to feed Nazi pigs. It is compulsory to contribute once a month to the Venter Helper Man, who collects relief money and food, which the family saved by serving a one-dish meal last Sunday. I'll hit left. I'll hit left. In the markets, prices are government controlled, kept high to benefit the farmer, who is essential in the Nazi program, the plan to make Germany self-sustaining. In repeated slogans, the farmer is told that he is the bulwark of the new nation. His farm becomes a unit in the Reich's subsistence plan. He grows what he is told or loses his farm, and he must meet his fixed production quota. But although under this pressure, Germany has in five years come to produce 80% of all food it needs, it is evident today that if the state is ever to become 100% self-sustaining in foodstuffs, it must expand. And louder than ever from propaganda headquarters comes the cry that Germany must have more land to grow grain. As often as good Nazis read in their government-controlled papers that for the fatherland they must eat less beef and eggs, they hear in a propaganda department broadcast how much worse off other nations are. Special Nazi award for obedience is the privilege of joining low-cost excursions subsidized by the state. Through them, every year, over a million Nazis, young and old, spend their holidays traveling through the fatherland, come back filled with pride of German history, steeped in Nazi culture, and properly thankful to their Führer. From the time the German child is old enough to understand anything, he ceases to be an individual and is taught that he was born to die for the fatherland. Scarcely out of kindergarten, the child must take the place allotted to him in the great Nazi scheme, and from then on, think and act as he is told. When at 14, the Nazi boy enters the Hitler Jugend, he receives his first uniform and his first rank in the German war machine. From enthusiastic young gliders, the Air Force will pick pilots for the bombers and pursuit ships of aerial warfare. Along with her brother, the Nazi girl is taken over by the state. Later, she must serve in the girl's compulsory labor service, do farm work and housework without pay. Then follows government schooling. How to conserve precious food and fuel, which a nation preparing for war dare not waste. Most important, how to care for the babies the army expects her to bear. At 18, every young man must serve six months in the Arbeitsdienst, where hard work and exercise will build the body to Nazi standards. laborer without pay, he works on the Reich's new conservation projects, flood control and soil erosion, and on the new military highways which the government is extending out toward every frontier. Because Hitler believes that too much education is dangerous, the young Nazi gets his only schooling after working hours, a daily lecture on Germany's need for expansion and the triumph he will share when German armies march into the rich wheat fields of the Russian Ukraine. For 
Hitler's two million brown-shirted stormtroopers, the government provides food in abundance. These young volunteers are the Nazi militia, and proud is the youth who is selected for the black-shirted Schutzstaffel, Hitler's own guard. Thus, brought up in a group, trained in a group, the young German grows up to take his place in the most inclusive group of all, the Army of the Reich, in which every able-bodied man must serve actively for one full year, in the reserves for the rest of his life. Most famed piece of Nazi propaganda is the annual military display at Nuremberg, specially staged to show the world the force of German arms. In Berlin, the Nazi propaganda bureau is preparing the publicity which next summer it is hoped will draw thousands of tourists to see the picturesque Germany of yesterday, to leave much needed American dollars in the Nazi Germany of today. In New York City, loudest mouthpiece in this Nazi propaganda drive is the national chairman of the Hitler-inspired German-American Bund. He is Fritz Kuhn, former German machine gunner, now a naturalized American citizen who claims to have enrolled 200,000 U.S. Germans under the swastika. At his meetings, Führer Kuhn preaches orthodox fascist doctrine. Across the United States, Führer Kuhn has established 25 summer camps and drill grounds, where those German-Americans who believe in Nazi teachings can imitate Hitler's mighty military machine. At New York meetings, designed to promote friendship and end the U.S. boycotts on German goods, uniformed Nazis parade. Sieg Heil! Sieg Heil! Their mere appearance doubles the picket line. When Führer Kuhn, with plans drawn for a New England Nazi encampment, purchases a site in Connecticut, he meets unexpected opposition in a community long proud of its tolerance. We have no quarrel with what we term the older order of German people. But we do object, and we do protest against the insidious, treacherous activities of Nazi agents masquerading as American citizens. Mr. Chairman. Two of my great-great-grandfathers and four of my great-grandfathers fought for liberty. So did the other people of this town. I call upon all of you here to keep the Nazis out. But the most discouraging blow to the Nazi campaign for U.S. sympathy comes from the retiring American ambassador to Germany, William E. Dodd. Living in Europe these days is profoundly discouraging. Nazism and fascism are gaining ground everywhere. This is a world crisis, the greatest crisis for democracy since the first Napoleon. Joined together by mutual self-interest, the two strong men of fascism view the results of their long struggle for dominance in Europe with unconcealed satisfaction. <laughs> Behind these leaders lies an unbroken succession of fascist triumphs, military and political. The rearming of the Rhineland, the conquest of Ethiopia, the Saar Basin, the revolt in Spain, and the new Rome-Berlin-Tokyo alliance. Around them are other nations already inoculated with the fascist fever. But of the fascist nations in Europe today, Germany emerges as the supreme example. Democracy is destroyed. The dictator is a demigod who can do no wrong. Propaganda dominates the nation's mind. Nazi Germany faces her destiny with one of the great war machines in history. 
and the inevitable destiny of the great war machines of the past has been to destroy the peace of the world, its people, and the governments of their time. Time marches on.